Um, well, um, this is the continuing with the book of the Acts of the Apostles, and this will be the 68th part, part 68 of the book of the Acts of the Apostles. Now, last week, um, we looked at the rejected stone in the course of the witness and defense of uh, Peter and John uh, before the Sanhedrin. They mentioned age-long uh, biblical parable, the stone that the builders rejected have become the, has become rather the chief of the cornerstone. Now, so in, in application, they pointed out that Jesus Christ is that stone which they, the Sanhedrin, the builders, rejected. Today, we find many church leaders acting in the mold of the Sanhedrin, rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ as they turn their backs on the true gospel in favor of a false prosperity gospel. The building are the believers and it's one thing that is clear. Without this cornerstone, this chief cornerstone, the building cannot stand. No Christian can stand without him. In fact, the Bible tells us that there is no other name whereby men might be saved but the name of Jesus Christ. So without the builder, uh, with, without the, the, this cornerstone in our own lives, Christians, we are not saved. We have no salvation. So we, I think we said last week that we are not to be like Israel of old in the wilderness who missed the rest of God because of unbelief and hardness of heart. Because they, they could not, they could not walk with God. They rejected, they, they rejected his word and they rejected him. Let us not be like the, the, the Sanhedrin who, because they wanted to maintain themselves and whatever it was that they were holding on to, they rejected the, 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 the stone that Almighty God had prepared for them to be a part of their lives. Let us not be like them. So let's go to um, Acts chapter 4, and we'll be reading from verse 7 to 13. Acts chapter 4, from 7 to 13. We had said last week that we're going to go through uh, one, Acts 4, 1 to 22, and begin to pick out a few things that God wants us to learn. So today, we will be looking at Acts chapter 4, verse 7 to 13. And I read, And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power, by what name, have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, If we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all. And... To all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled, and they realized that they, that is Peter and John, had been with Jesus. The Lord bless the reading of his word in Jesus' name. Amen. Peter and John gave an impassioned defense, shaming the Sanhedrin by what they said. The Sanhedrin were wroth at their impetuosity, their effrontery, their audacity, to even, spoke, to, to even speak to them the way they spoke and to say the things that they were saying. And they wondered where such a disposition was coming from, given that these were uneducated men, untrained men. They were not men of religion. They were not men of letters. Yet they were speaking biblical adage. They were speaking things that uh, they, they, it, it awed them. And they spoke with such boldness. They were not trained men. They, were, they did not attend any of their Bible colleges. They did not train under uh, Gamaliel or, or any of the known rabbis in the place. And they marveled and wondered, ah, what's going on? Where, where is this thing coming from? Have, have you heard what they are saying? Can you imagine these boys talking to us this way? What, where, where are they getting it from? 
finally, as they were wondering about themselves, somebody or a few people must have whispered that, ah, look at them now. Don't you recognize them? Eh? These are people who were with Jesus. So they realized that they had been with Jesus. They had been companions. They had been followers of Jesus. They had walked with this Jesus. They probably saw them in the temple at some point in time or another. And they, 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 they were wondering that, ah, okay, so these are the, these are the young lads who were, who were all over the place with him. Let me just read something in John chapter 7, verse 15. John chapter 7, verse 15. Um, and the Jews marveled, saying, how does this man know letters having never studied? They marveled at the Lord Jesus Christ himself that, ah, how does he know these things? How does he understand this? He didn't go to any school. We know that his father did not, he was a carpenter. He didn't have education. So how does, how is he able to say the things that he's saying? That's what they said about the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what they're now saying about his followers. So for our story, we shall be looking, for our study rather, today, we shall be looking at the conclusion which rested, as it were, the amazement of the Sanhedrin. At, in, in the form of the, uh, in, we're going to look at it in the form of a question. Because they, they said, the Bible says, and they realized, verse uh, 13, the last sentence says, and they realized that they had been with Jesus. So we want to look at that and ask a question. We, we may not do all of it today. So maybe today and next week, we'll see how God will help us. So the question is, have you been with Jesus? Have you been with Jesus? That's, that would form the, the theme or the topic of what we want to discuss. Now, I must quickly make a distinction here as we introduce this subject. There is a difference between have you been with Jesus and have you been to Jesus? There's a difference. In Matthew chapter 11 verse 28, Matthew chapter 11 verse 28, the Lord Jesus Christ said, Come unto me, all ye that, are lab that, that, are, that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come to me. So, have you been to Jesus is not what we are talking about. Is have you been with Jesus? In John chapter 7, 37, when the Lord Jesus Christ was asking them to come and drink of him, he said, if you are still thirsty, after all this festivity and everything, come to me and drink. So, we're not talking of going to, we're not asking, have you been to Jesus? No. We're asking, have you been with Jesus. Then I must make another distinction from have you been with Jesus, which is have you been to see Jesus? I'm not saying that's not what we're saying here. In John chapter 3, we know of Nicodemus who went to see Jesus at night. So we're not talking of whether you have gone to see Jesus. We are saying, have you been with Jesus? In John chapter 12, verse 20 to 21, let me just read a bit of that. John 12, let me put it on the screen. John chapter 12, um, 20 to 21. The Bible says, Now there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. When they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sorry, then they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. That's not what we're talking about here. We're not asking you have, you, have you seen Jesus? No, we're not talking about that. Because you can see him and not have been with him. You, can have be, you, you, you may have been to him, but not have been with him. Then the last thing I want, also want to make a distinction here. In John chapter 7, John chapter 7, uh, let me just read verse 46. Uh, take a few verses or just that one verse. The, okay, the officers answered, no man ever spoke like this man. Then the Pharisees answered them, Are you also deceived? This was because they had sent the officers to go and arrest Jesus. And they heard him. And they couldn't arrest him. And they came back and said, No man ever spoke like this man. So the Pharisees said, Are, are you also deceived? So we are not asking, Have you been to hear Jesus? No. We said, Have you been with Jesus? Have you been with Jesus? In um, Mark chapter 3, Mark chapter 3, verse 13 to 15. Mark 3, 13 to 15, the Bible says, And he, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, went up on the mountain and called to him 
those he himself wanted. And they came to him. Then he appointed twelve that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out demons. And we have a list of the names. Simon, Peter, James, and so on and so forth up till verse 19. He, he called a lot of people to him. They came. But from the numbers that came, he now chose 12 that they should be with him. They should be his companions. They should be his associates. They should be people who will be close to him. In John chapter 1, from verse 29, the Bible tells us about John the Baptist. When he was uh, uh, baptizing, after baptizing Jesus, one day people were around him and he saw Jesus coming towards him and he pointed to Jesus and said, this is the lamb who takes away the sins of the world. Nobody said anything. It, it was, it was just, as far as they were concerned, he was giving the information. The next day, the same thing happened. He saw Jesus coming and he said, look, the, behold, this is the lamb who takes away the sins of the world. Two of his disciples, Andrew and John, heard that and they left and they went after the Lord Jesus Christ. As they were going after, as they were following him, the Lord turned and saw them and said, ah, what are you looking for? Why are you following me? What seek ye? They said, Rabbi, please show us where you stay. Show us your house. And they went and stayed with him. The Bible says that it was already evening, so they stayed there. They went and stayed with him. The next morning, Andrew ran, went home, and called his brother Simon and brought him to Jesus. And the Lord Jesus Christ, looking at Simon, said to him, You are Simon, but your name will be called Peter or Cephas. But Simon Peter left. So we are trying to make a distinction here between going, uh, being with Jesus and going to him, going to see him, going to hear him. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking of being a companion with him. In Luke chapter 5, Luke chapter 5, we will see a precursor to that. From verse 1, I'm not going to read it. We know the story. How the Lord was preaching somewhere. Peter had been fishing all night. He didn't catch any fish. He was um, miserable. As he was going to, as he was washing the nets and trying to clean the things, um, the Lord Jesus Christ said, please, can I use your boat? He said, well, use it now. So he used the boat to be preaching. After, after preaching, he said to him, just move out a little bit. The fellow, Peter went a little bit. He said, cast your net for a drought. And, Lord, and Peter said to him that, sir, we have been fishing all night. We didn't catch anything. You have been preaching all day and you have, made, you have been making noise. Then he said, well, well at the, at, because you have said so, I will cast my net. And he cast his net and caught such a drought of fish that, I mean, the boat was about to sink. So let's take it from verse 8 of Luke chapter 5. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will catch men. So when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. When we talk of being with Jesus, we are speaking of something deeper than just a casual acquaintance. Peter and the others, they forsook everything to be with him. So let's, let's look at what we are talking about. To have been with Jesus is to have left all and to remain with him, not going about. You have left all, you have remained with him, not for pecuniary reasons, not because you want something to eat, or because you want to be famous, or because you want to be known, or because you, they, they've told you that there's money to be made, Jesus will make you rich. So that's why, no, but because you are convinced, and you are doing this for the rest of your life, it's not a part-time thing. It's not something that you are doing now and then you are leaving. You are convinced that this Jesus is the person that I need in my life. This Jesus, I need to know him. I don't just want to go to get... You see, when you go to him, it's because you want to get something. When you go to see him, it's because you have heard about him and you just want to look upon him to say, ah, 
this man, this man, I, I, I just, I just like the way he looks. Or you want to hear him because you've heard that when he speaks, things happen. So you want, you want to go and listen to him. No, we're talking of following him, forsaking all to go after him. In John chapter 6, John chapter 6, um, from verse uh, 60, from verse 60, therefore, Many of his disciples, when they heard this, because he had been talking about he is the bread of life and that um, he, 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 he is there, that if they don't eat him and drink his blood, they cannot be a part of him. And they thought that he was preaching cannibalism. So the Bible says, therefore, many of his disciples, these were not the members of the inner circle, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying. Who can understand it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, does this offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. So let's, let's get this right. When we talk of, have you been with Jesus? We're not talking of somebody who just went to church. No, we're talking of somebody who has the conviction. That's why they come to believe. You, the, this is not a casual believing. This is a belief with conviction. And as a result of your belief, you will do whatever he says you should do. He also knew who would betray him in verse 65. He says, and he said, therefore I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my father. This is a very important point. It's not what we want to discuss, but it's important to note that. You may have been hearing the word of God. The day the Father will draw you, you will go. That is why sometimes you don't need to preach long. People will just say, I'm willing, because the Father says, I want to use this. I want to have mercy on this soul. I want, I, 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 I want my grace to flow to this person. That's why you see a lot of people coming to Christ. In verse 66, the Bible says, from that time, Many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. So you see, they went to him. But maybe they were not getting what they wanted to get. They couldn't be with him. And so they went back and followed him no more. In verse 67, then Jesus said to the twelve, do you also want to go away? You see, when you are with him, you will get an opportunity to go. You will get an opportunity to backslide. The question is, will you backslide? In verse 68, but Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. He was convinced. Where else are we going to go to? You are the one who has the word of eternal life. We've been with you. It may not be easy, but you have the words that gives eternal life. You have what it takes for me to live beyond this world. In verse 69, also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. I, I think we've said this before. When we, one, one time we discussed Matthew chapter 16. And we spoke about the church. And when he said, on this rock will I build. This is the basis of our salvation. That we know and we confess and we are convinced. That Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. He is the Christ, the Messiah, the savior of the world. On those two legs stands the, the foundation of eternal life for everyone who believes. That is what we must believe. In verse 70, Jesus answered them, did I not choose you, the twelve, and one of you is a devil, saying to them that, I know I chose twelve of you, but there is one fellow who is there for a different purpose. He spoke, verse 71 says, he spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who betrayed, who would betray him, being one of the twelve. So, we are speaking here of People who have left all out of a conviction. Judas Iscariot left all not out of a conviction. But because he thought there was something to gain. He was amongst the twelve. He had an opportunity to be with him. But instead he went to him. In Genesis chapter 5. Genesis 5. I want to read a, a, a story that we may be familiar with. That will challenge you and I. From verse uh, 21. 
Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. This is what we're talking about here. When we say, have you been with Jesus for the rest of your life? Enoch gave birth to Methuselah at 65. From that age, after he gave birth to Methuselah, the Bible says he began to walk with God. And he walked with God for 300 years on this earth. And one day God said, no, I, I am going to use this fellow later. Come. And nobody could find Enoch. He's, nobody saw his dead body. Nobody saw anything. Why? Because God has taken him. Enoch is in heaven today. He walked God for 300 years. He still had sons and daughters. So he still fulfilled his marital obligations. He still fulfilled parental obligations. He still fulfilled societal obligations. But he walked with God. Have you been with Jesus? Many of us have a way of making excuse for not being close to the Lord. We have a reason. Oh, it's my work. Oh, it's my school. Oh, it's my it's the ministry. Oh, it's my wife. It's my children. It's my husband. We give many reasons. Not one of those reasons is tenable before God. Not one. Because when you follow Jesus, when you are with him, there is a conviction that made you to go to be with him. And when you are convinced, unlike Judas, who was there for pecuniary reasons, but when you are there for out of conviction that this is the one, like Peter said, you have the words of eternal life. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. When you go on that basis, you will stick with him. One man of God was writing on Facebook recently, and he said that if your prayer is, for, he says, no, he says, if something happens and you leave God, you abandon him and you go away because maybe you are angry or you got prosperity, then your prayer life was nothing more than, I want, I want, I want. But that if actually your prayer life was the result of relationship, you cannot leave Jesus. You can't abandon him because one thing has happened to you. Either you got a promotion in the office, or your, your prayer life is your, I'm not talking of church. I'm speaking of private prayer life. I'm speaking of a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And until you get to that place, you have not been with him. You may have been to him, you may have been to see him, you may have been to hear him, but you have not been with him. Another thing that we want to note about being with Jesus is that it means to be in union with him as a close associate of his, such that from the perspective of people who are looking at you, they can see clearly that there is a rub-off of him on you. They look at your action. They look at your speech. They look at your mannerism. They say, this fellow is talking like Jesus. It seems like he has been with him. In Mark chapter 14, you can read that later, 43 to 46, Mark 14, 43 to 46. That, is, that was the betrayal of the Lord Jesus Christ by Judas. Sometimes we have to wonder, why was Jesus needed to betray Jesus? There were two things that occurred to me here. Number one, only Judas knew where he would have been at that time. Because he always went to Gethsemane at, at some, so he knew where he would have been at that time. That's number one. But more importantly, it was difficult to distinguish him from his disciples. So you needed somebody on the inside to betray him. So Judas said, this is how I'm going to show you who it is. Is the person I kiss. And the Lord himself said, are you going to betray, are you betraying me with a kiss? And that was how the Lord was betrayed. He was betrayed because it was difficult to differentiate him from the others. So they needed somebody who knew him, who knew his hideouts, who knew where he would be to betray him. Which was the, 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 the purpose of Judas. In first First John, First John chapter 3, First John chapter 3 
And um, we'll read from verse 7. 1 John 3 from verse 7. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous. Just as he, that is as Jesus, is righteous. He who sins is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin. For his seed remains in him. And he cannot sin because he has been born of God. You've heard, I'm sure you've heard some parents say, who gave birth to this child? Can a lion give birth to a goat? I'm sure you've heard sayings like that. Why? Because they do not see their DNA in that child. And they call the mother and say, come, my dear, tell me now. Are you sure that I'm the one that gave birth to this boy? And that's what the Bible is saying here. That the seed of God is in us. And so we cannot sin. We cannot knowingly sin. We may accidentally fall into sin. That means we do not revel in it. We don't swim in it. Having accidentally fallen on it, fallen into sin, we quickly jump out and clean ourselves. It's like you're walking somewhere and you accidentally step on poop on the road. Whatever poop it is. The first thing you're going to be looking for is how to get rid of the poop from your shoe. You don't walk on as if nothing has happened. And then you continue to go to other places with the poop on your... No, you want to clean it and get it, get rid of it. Because you know it's not necessary. It's, it's, it's something that is wrong for you. So when you are with Jesus, it is a union. When you have been with him, there is a union. There is, there is something that you, you interact and you, there is a rub off. We see it a lot in married couples. You see a rub off. The wife behaving like the husband, the husband taking some of the nature from of the attitude of the wife. Why? They've been together for a long time. They can tell what the other is saying. They know. Look at verse 10. In this, the children of God and the children of the, of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God. Nor is he who does not love his brother. You can read the rest later. So there is, there is something that is in Christ. That you will find when people have been with him. Because it's a union. It's an interaction that brings about a rub off of his nature, of his character, of the way he acts, of the way he speaks, of the way he does things upon those who are united with him. Thirdly, to have been with Jesus is to have his spirit rest on you such that his spirit is the one speaking through you. You will recall, let's go back to Acts chapter 4, that when Peter was going to begin to speak, the Bible made, the Bible made a statement in verse 8. It says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, to have been with Jesus, is to have been filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm not talking of the ones where people are filled with the Holy Spirit, but they still abuse people. They are filled with the Holy Spirit, but they are still beating their wives. They are still insulting their husbands. No, that's not what we're talking about. We are speaking of that feeling of the Holy Spirit that is both within and without. They are full on the inside and they are filled on the outside. The, the, the nature, the, 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 the human nature has been removed by the, by the entrance of the Spirit of God into that person. It is, that, it, it is the presence of the Spirit of God within us that brings about this union. In John chapter 3 verse 34, John 3 34, the Bible tells us that the Lord Jesus Christ was we, we had the Spirit be, we, beyond measure. We have the Spirit in, with measure. In 2 Kings chapter 2 verse 15, 2 Kings chapter 2 verse 15, when Elisha followed Elijah across the Jordan, and returned without Elijah, the sons of the prophet made a statement. They said, the spirit of Elijah doth rest on Elisha. They saw a rub off. Don't forget, the sons of the prophet were in the school that Elijah was teaching. Elijah was their master. 
they were the, they were the disciples. But there was something unique about Elisha. First of all, the Bible tells us that Elisha poured water on Elijah's hands. Then when Elijah was trying to shake Elisha off to go away, Elisha told him, as the Lord liveth, I am following you wherever you are going to. He tried to tell him, don't come. We followed him. If you, if you, if you go back, I think it's 1 Kings chapter 19 or so. The Bible tells us that when Elijah was running away from Jezebel and he got to Bathsheba, he told his servant to stay there and he went into the wilderness and the servant stayed. And after Elijah had finished with the wilderness, we never heard that Elijah went back to Bathsheba to meet that fellow. Instead, Elijah went on and threw his mantle on Elisha. And Elisha followed him from that day on. So he was trying to shake Elisha of the way he shook off the other fellow. The other fellow went away. But Elisha said, never, we are going together. This is what we mean by being with Jesus. You will hold on to him say, no matter what. If they are going to kill me there, let them kill me. But I'm with you. If I'm going to starve, let me starve. But I'm with you. You remember what Ruth said to Naomi. When Naomi begged her and said, please go back now. Your other uh, fellow, I can't even remember her name. Nobody remembers her name. Eh? Can't remember her name. Ruth said, look. Uh, Naomi said, that one has gone back. Why don't you follow? Ruth said, I am not going back. Wherever you go, there I will go. Wherever they bury you, there they will bury me. Your God will be my God. I, wherever it is, they are going, anything, I'm going with you. And Naomi said, that, the Bible said that when Naomi saw that she really meant it, she left her alone. And Ruth went. And by the grace of God, she became a part of the Jewish history. Indeed, she became, she went in, she became in the lineage not only of David, but also of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because she followed. So we must understand this. We are talking of a union with the Lord. Such that you cannot, you cannot, you cannot, you know, detach. We are speaking of the Spirit of God resting upon you. That is the Spirit of Jesus resting upon you. In Numbers chapter 11, let me just read that. Numbers chapter 11, uh, verse 16. Numbers 11, 16. Uh, Moses had been complaining about not being able to deal with the, the challenges of the children of Israel. The Bible says, so the Lord said, in verse 16, the Bible says, so the Lord said to Moses, gather to me 70 men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be elders of the people and officers over them. Bring them to the tabernacle of meeting that they may stand there with you. Verse 17. Then I will come down and talk with you there. I will take of the spirit that is upon you. And will put the same upon them. And they shall bear the burden of the people with you. That you may not bear it yourself alone. Please note that. It's not as if God took the spirit of, of, uh, the spirit of God upon Moses. And divided it into 70. No. The same spirit was upon all the 70s. If you read later. So, uh, two of them were not present at, at this place. They were doing work in the in the in tabernacle, and the Bible rec records that they began to speak. They were speaking in tongues right there in the camp. And Joshua ran to Moses to say, "Come and see these people. They are, they are speaking in tongues in the camp. Forbid them." Moses said, "Ah, how I wish all of us will have the Spirit of God in us." That prayer was answered in Acts chapter two, when the when the when the disciples were gathered together. And the Bible tells us that the, the, suddenly the Spirit of God came upon them and they spoke in other tongues. He, they saw it as cloven tongues of fire. Upon 120, each one of them, the same Spirit. When Peter was writing a letter, I think in uh, 2 Peter chapter two, uh, chapter 1, verse 1 or so, of, uh, I think it's verse 1, he spoke about people who had the like precious faith. People who had the same faith. We are speaking of the same spirit. The same faith brings the same spirit. So we are speaking of the spirit of God upon us. The same spirit that was upon Jesus. I'm not talking of the spirit that made him to perform miracles. and That is part of it. But I'm speaking of the same spirit that was upon Jesus that he did not sin. That same spirit is what we are speaking about here. In 2 
Corinthians chapter 3 from verse 16. The Bible says, nevertheless, it was speaking about Moses, the time of Moses, when Moses would go to the uh, go up to the mountain and pray to God. And then when he when when he comes back, his face will be shining, and the people will not be able to look, and Moses will cover his face with a veil so that people will be able to come near and he will tell them what the Lord is saying. But they couldn't receive it. Why? The Bible says their hearts were closed, their hearts were shut. Why? He says, till now, the, that veil that Moses was putting over, over his face actually covered their hearts. They couldn't look on the glory of God. And that same veil covered their hearts, so they couldn't receive the word of God. So in verse, 13, in verse 16 of 2 Corinthians chapter 3, the Bible says, Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. The veil of degree, having a degree, the veil of academics, the veil of the world, the veil of culture, the veil of tradition, the veil of how my father did this, the veil of this is how my mother used to do it, the veil of this is how my pastor does it, this is how my geo does it. That veil is removed, is torn. That's what it actually means to say removed, not that it removed. It is actually ripped apart when we turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. If you don't turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, the veil still cover so that you always need your bishop to speak to you. You always need your general overseer to speak to you. Whereas the Lord wants to speak to you directly in that relationship by his spirit and through his spirit. In verse 17, it says, now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. We are set free. It doesn't mean that we are free to now go and do whatever we want to do. No, we are liberated. From sin, the power, the stronghold of sin. We are liberated from tradition. We are liberated from culture. We are liberated from the stronghold that many church leaders have over their people. We are set free because of the Spirit of God. And it says the Lord is that Spirit. So the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ and His Spirit are one and the same. Even though they are separate they have separate identities but they have the same nature the same character operating the same power in the same way it says where the spirit of the lord is there is liberty there is freedom from oppression from sin from 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 being from being tied down by one thing or the other it doesn't mean that you are going to be reckless in verse 18 it says but we all all of us with unveiled face, the veil has been torn because we have turned to Jesus, beholding us in a mirror, the glory of the Lord. Because we are now looking at Jesus, we are seeing his glory. And as we are seeing his glory, he says, we are being transformed because of that association into the same image from glory to glory, from glory to glory, just as by the spirit of the Lord. In degrees. You don't look at him today. And look away. And then tomorrow. You want to look at him and grow in degree. No. Where you left off. You are going to begin all over again. You must keep constantly looking at him. Keep constantly looking. How do we look at the Lord Jesus Christ today? We look at the word. We look at the word of God. What is written in the, in the word of God. We must be open. If we are not open, we cannot receive from the Lord. The glory does not come because of the veil that is covering. The same second uh, Corinthians, let me read verse six, uh, chapter 6 from verse 11. Paul is writing here to the Corinthians. He says, oh Corinthians, we have spoken openly to you. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted by your own affections, your likes, your desires. They are not in line with what we have for you. Now in return for the same, I speak as to children. You also be open. Be open to God. In verse 40 it says, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Don't turn there. Be open to God. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? How do we, how do we marry relationship with God? And then we are holding on to darkness. We're holding on to the words of men. We're holding on to society and culture and tradition. How do we marry the two together? We have been unequally yoked. And when there's an unequal yoking, usually the stronger breaks the neck of the weaker. 
So when they yoke oxen together, they weigh them. They measure them that they are of equal strength. Then they put them together. You don't put a weak one with a strong one. The man who is unequally yoked with the world is weak in faith. And so the world will break his neck. Will drag him away. So don't be unequally yoked. Be open to God. Be open to the spirit of God. Look steadily upon Jesus. And there will be that rub off. And his nature will come upon you. In verse 15 it says, And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? What are we doing? Yoking ourselves with them. Copying them. Pastors are today quoting from unbelievers. In their sermons. They are not, I, I can understand quoting a, a, a believer. Who is walking with God. And quoting, oh, this man said this in line with scripture. But I cannot understand how you would quote. It doesn't matter how great that man was. Quoting him does not help the salvation or the growth of any other person, of any Christian. In verse 16, it says, And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. How, how do we take on things of idols into our hearts? Where God wants to dwell. For as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord. Let's continue uh, chapter 7 verse 1 and 2. Therefore, Having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. That is the human spirit, the, the human the things of the flesh. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And verse 2. Open your hearts to us. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have cheated no one. Open your heart to the Lord. When your heart is open to the Lord. You will be able to receive his spirit. When you, when you turn to the Lord and the veil is taken away, stay there, be focused on the Lord. In your Bible study, in your prayer, in your, in your, in your, in, in your conversations, be focused on him. Be open in your heart towards him. And you will see his spirit doing some interesting things in your life. In John chapter 14, John chapter 14, Verse 23 and 22. After the Lord had told him that he would, that he, he would be with them by his spirit. And uh, one, one of them, Judas, not Judas Iscariot, asked him, he said, how, how are you going to manifest yourself to us and not to the world? In verse 23, hear the word the Lord Jesus Christ said. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. We're going to talk more on this maybe next week or I don't know, maybe next week or so. He says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. He will obey me. And my father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. So if you are to be with Jesus, you must be obedient to his word. In verse 24 it says, he who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. You cannot be living in disobedience and say you have been with Jesus. No, you have not been with him. He cannot even be with you. We're going to look at that, I think, next week. We're going to talk in some more detail about this. But it's important to understand that the way God describes love is not the way you and I describe love. Human love is shown by the way we buy gifts for people, or the way we do one or two things for people. The, gift, the, the, the love that we have towards God is made manifest by our obedience to God. So, if you say you have been with Jesus, number one, it means you have left all out of conviction and you are following him and you are remaining with him for the rest of your life. From the day you got born again, it means that you have not backslidden or there's no room for you to backslide. It's not as if opportunity to backslide will not be there. It will be there. But you've made up your mind that I'm following Jesus no matter what. 
I'm going to be with him. Secondly, it means there's a relationship with you. There's a union and intimacy in such a way that people can see. They saw Peter and John. They took notice. They, uh, they had been with Jesus. They could see that there was a rub off. The same way they sp spoke about the Lord Jesus. That this one did not go to school. And look at what he's saying. The same thing they said about them. These ones have not been to school. And see what they are saying. See how they are behaving. See the audacity. The impetuosity. The effrontery that they have. In, calling, in telling us that we are the builders that rejected the stone. Where did they come from? Who are these people? What school? Thirdly, to be with Jesus is to have his spirit in our lives. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is in our lives. That same spirit is speaking to us, speaking through us, changing our, transforming our, 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 our being into conformity with the Lord Jesus Christ. So the question we are asking. As we conclude now. Is about. Our constant. Consistent. Interaction of fellowship with Jesus. So we are asking. Are you constantly and consistently. In fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you constantly and consistently. Interacting with the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I, I, I read something about Smith Wigglesworth. He was at dinner one day and um, I think they had engaged in conversation for like eight, eight or so minutes. And suddenly he said, oh, sorry, Lord, uh, I, I should have conferred with you. And he broke off from the conversation and remained quiet for some time. And then he said, okay, let's continue. And they asked him, what is, what is all that about? He said, actually, I check in with the Lord every five minutes. And that it just occurred to him that he hadn't checked in five minutes before. That he had been engrossed in that conversation. Constant, consistent fellowship. It's not until you go and lock a door. Or until you, you spend two hours praying at it, which is a very good thing, by the way. But constantly. Because what some of us do is, we pray. After we've prayed in the morning, that's the end. No, no, no interaction. No conversation. We just go on and do whatever we want to do. But we are speaking here of that constant constant interaction fellowship where we are in constant communion with the Lord from morning till night. Where our decisions are not our own, but they are His. We are asking the question, do you have a personal relationship with the Lord? Do you have a one-on-one -on -one, or is a relationship with the Lord through your pastor, through your bishop, through your general overseer? Is that your relationship with the Lord? You cannot, you cannot stay at home and talk to the Lord and hear God for yourself. You need to hear from man. Don't forget the old prophet who deceived that young man of God. That young man of God had his ministry cut short by an old prophet. That old prophet was in, was in Israel, but God did not ask him to go to Rehoboam. Ah, sorry, sorry, to Jeroboam. It was the, 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 the young man of God that God sent from Judah to Israel. And yet he was able to deceive that fellow. There are some vessels that have been disused by, that have, have been disused by God. I don't mean to cast aspersions on anybody, but that is the truth. And if you are not able to hear from God, you are going to have a problem. For example, we know in, in uh, 1 Samuel, I think it's chapter 3, that God had already done away with Eli and his, and his sons and wanted to speak to Samuel. And he went to call Samuel. But nobody had been teaching Samuel, so Samuel did not even know how to respond to God. And so when God called Samuel, Samuel would run to Eli. He will not until the third time Eli suspected that maybe God wants to speak to this man. Eli told him, the next time you hear that voice, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And that's how God spoke to Samuel. What God wanted to say to Samuel, he couldn't pass through another person. He had to tell him himself. I've told people, like the Bible says, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither has it entered into the hearts of men, the things that God has planned for them that love him. 
Nobody can come and prophesy to you about what God wants to do in your life. Whatever prophecy is making is the tip of the iceberg. He can't see everything. If he did, he would never prophesy to you. It is time for you and I to develop a personal relationship with the Lord. That is what it means to have been with him. That you have a personal relationship with him. It means, and I'm asking the question, do you have a surrendered heart to the Lord? Have you surrendered your heart yet to the Lord? Because if you have not surrendered your heart to the Lord, he will not be with you and you cannot be with him. Isaiah chapter 66. Isaiah 66, verse 1, verse 1 and 2. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things my hand has made and all those things exist, says the Lord. But on this one will I look, on him who is poor, not more poor financially, but of a poor spirit, on who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. Are you surrendered in your heart to God? That when you hear the word of God, you, 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 you take it seriously. That's what we're talking about here. You take it seriously. You, you don't joke with the word of God. You, you don't read the Bible and then just, just wave it off and argue with it and debate with it. Have you been with Jesus? Do you have a surrendered heart? A heart that will not struggle or argue with the word of God. A heart that is plowable, pliable. A, 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 a heart that is contrite before God. A heart that is poor. That is a heart that recognizes its poverty and its need for God. If you have that heart, God will be with you. God will come with you. God will come and be with you. And you will be with God. We are, we are asking the question. Do you have a crucified and resurrected life? Have you been crucified with Christ and been raised up by him? Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Let's read from verse 5. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, crucified with him, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, resurrected with him. So the crucified life and resurrected life. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. That the body of sin might be done away with. That we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God forever. So it's the same thing. Bible says in verse 11, Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. We are with him. We are walking with him. We are alive with him. We were crucified, but now we are raised. We are crucified so that sin is cut off from our lives. We are, we are raised back. We are raised, we are raised uh, back from the dead in the power of the Spirit of God so that we can live unto God. Not unto ourselves, but unto God. In verse 12 it says, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. Don't let sin reign in your bodies. That, that is what you are now obeying. You are doing whatever sin is asking you to do. When you get to, if you get, when later you can read chapter 7. Where you see a man who is, who is supposed to be saved but is being controlled by sin. And yet Jesus Christ came to save him. In verse 13 it says, And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under the under law, but under grace. God cannot walk with a sinner. If God wants to walk with a sinner, the first thing he does is to save his soul and wash him in the blood of Jesus. The Bible says that God is of purer eyes than to behold iniquity. So we cannot be living in sin and be claiming that we have been with Jesus. We have not been with Jesus. 
In verse 15, he says, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? Certainly not. Those people who are preaching a, a, a strange message of grace. That is not grace. That is living in sin. Verse 16. Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one slaves? Whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? Whoever you are obeying is your master. If Jesus is your master, you will obey him. If sin is your master, you will obey sin. Who are you listening to? Who is shaping your world? If it is the world that is shaping your world, then you are of the world. If it is Jesus that is shaping your world, then you are of Christ. And you have been, you are with him. You have been with him. Continuous present tense. Verse 17. But God be thanked that though you were slaves, you were slaves of sin. Yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. When you come to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. You are now a slave to righteousness. You do only what is right. That's what it means there. You are a slave. The only thing you can do is right. But if you are still doing what is wrong, you need to check. Maybe you are not with the Lord. Maybe you have turned your face again and you are looking at what the world is doing. You are looking at what somebody is doing. Do, do you know that there are some spiritual leaders who do some things, some very strange things, and you be wondering why they do it. You say, well, you know, we, we have, we, we understand what God is doing. No. I remember one, 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 one fellow who was sleeping with a particular girl. And the girl was, this was her pastor. And the pastor was sleeping with this girl. And this girl, after a while, the girl would be, the girl was, was being, was being pained in her, in her, her spirit was being, was, was dying. And she, she said, she would, she would tell the man that, ah, ah, sir, this is his problem. And the girl, the man said, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. I'm, I'm working with God by grace. I understand, I understand God perfectly well. Nothing is going to happen to me. And if you understand him, nothing will happen to you. Let's continue. Until that hold was broken by the grace of God. So let's not get confused with people who say, who think that they are doing what is right, but they are slaves to sin. That pastor was a slave to sin. He didn't know. He was trying to fool himself by saying that God is okay. He, he, he has not been able to break away from that thing. And yet God had given him the grace to, but because he chose to live contrary, that's how he continued. Are you intimate with Jesus? Has he rubbed off on you? People who own cats, they know that when, when a cat comes around you, he, 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 you will see his fluff all over the place, your clothes, your, your furniture, everywhere. Because the cat is rubbing off all over you. In the same way, has the Lord Jesus Christ rubbed off on you? Has any of his, of, of his nature, of his, of his character, of his being rubbed off on you by reason of interaction? If not, you have not been with him. Because that's the question we're asking. Has he rubbed off on you? Can people say, ah, this fellow is different. What is happening to him? What has changed? Say, ah, he's been with Jesus. In, in, in John chapter 1, verse 6 to 8. Let me read that. John chapter 1, from verse 6. To verse 8. There was a man sent from God. Whose name was John. This man came for a witness. To bear witness of the light. That all. That, that all through him. Might believe. He was not that light. But was sent to bear witness of that light. People thought John the Baptist. Was the light. There was a way John the Baptist. Was conducting himself. And they thought this was Jesus. That's why they came to him in John chapter 1 and said, Are you the one? He said, I'm not the one. I'm just a voice in the wilderness crying. Make, make, make every guy pass straight. Repent. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. That's all I am. I'm just a voice. They thought he was the light. I think I've told the story before of a missionary who went to India. I think in the, in the 19th century. And then afterwards, uh, in the late 20th century, another missionary went there and um, was talking to them about Jesus. And there was this old man, quite an old man, aged maybe in his 80s or 90s, who was present at that meeting. 
And as this uh, missionary in the 20th century was talking, the old man raised up his hand and said, Ah, this man you are talking about, he was in our village. He said, who said Jesus? Jesus came to our village. I said, what do you mean by Jesus came to our village? So the old man was now pointing to some of the his fellow old men around that. Have you forgotten that other fellow who, that fellow who came when we were small? That was Jesus. That's who he's talking about. What was happening here? He, that missionary had behaved like Jesus would be. So as they were telling the story of Jesus, they could, he, that old man could relate with the way that other fellow was behaving. So the question is, can you be mistaken for Jesus? Would they need a fellow Christian to betray you? Like somebody said once, if you are arrested for being a Christian, will they find enough evidence to convict you? Can we mistaken you for Jesus? That's the question. I'm speaking to myself as well. Because it's a challenge. I mean, look at Peter and John. What audacity. What impetuosity. What effrontery. To be speaking to the Sanhedrin that way. What got into them? It was the Spirit of God in them. The Spirit of God came upon, filled Peter. And see how we spoke. And I'm going to ask this question. As we close now. Can. Or does God. Confide in you? It's a crucial question. In 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Let me put it on the screen. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, reading from verse 2 to verse 4. Paul's writing, he says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or whether out of the body I do not know. God knows. Such a one was caught up to the third heavens. Paul was, I didn't even know how I got there. I don't know whether I was physically transported or whether it was in the spirit. I don't know. In verse 3 says, and I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows how he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Paul said, I heard words. I dare not say them. In fact, it is, I cannot say them. You see, some of us think that every revelation must be spoken. No. When you have been taken up to that place, you will know that there are some things that you will just be, you will have to keep it in. You will not be able to see it because of what you know. Because of how God is going to deal with you on that matter. In Jeremiah 23, Jeremiah 23, verse 18, Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 18, For who has stood in the counsel of the Lord and has perceived and heard his word? Who has marked his word and heard it? There is a council, a place where God will sit and he wants to discuss some issues. And they will invite some people. He will sit down talking with the, um, with the Godhead, maybe angels are around. They will say, no, but we want some people to come and hear. They will invite people to that council meeting. You just, you are not there to, to, you are not there to make any statement. You are just there to watch. It's like in, when National Assembly is having its session and they have a gallery where the members of the public can come. That is how it is. God will give you grace and bring you. Say, sit down and listen to what we are saying. We hear, we, we know of, uh, is it Micaiah in, um, first Kings, is it 22 or so when Ahab, wanted to go to war and his false prophets were telling him to go. 400 of them were saying the same thing. And then uh, Jehoshaphat said to Ahab, is there no prophet of God here? These ones are just false prophets. He said, there's one, but he doesn't like it. He said, no, don't say that. Send for him. So they sent for Micaiah. The messenger said to Micaiah, everybody saying one thing. Please don't say anything different. Micaiah said, I'm only going to say what God said I should say. What God said I should say. So when Micaiah got uh, before Ahab, and Ahab said, should I go to war? Micaiah said, please go. Please go. In fact, you are going to be victorious. You are going to be victorious. Ahab said to Micaiah, have I not told you to stop telling me lies? Tell me the truth. So you see, Ahab knew what the truth was. But he loved the, the lies. There are many people who love those false prophecies. They love it. They know that these people are telling false prophecies. Last year, they told false prophecies. The year before, they told a lie. The other year, they told a lie. This year, you will see them again, carrying notebook to go and take prophecy. Why? That is the spirit in them, the spirit of deception. They've been so deceived, they cannot help themselves. 
Then Micaiah said to Ahab, he said, you see all these people? A lying prophet has entered them. Let me tell you what happened. Yesterday, God brought me into his council room. And I heard God speaking. And God said, I want to kill Ahab in a part in a, where was that place? Ramoth Gilead. Who can persuade him to go there? And the prophet and the angels were all saying one thing after the other. Then one angel came, one spirit or angel came. We don't know whether it's an angel of God or angel of Satan. He said, I will go and become a lying spirit in the tongue of Ahab's prophet. God said to him, go, you will succeed. Why? Because God knew that Ahab loved to hear lies. And after Micaiah had said all of that, Ahab did not listen. In fact, one of the prophets came and slapped Micaiah and said, where did the Spirit of God leave me to come to you? He now had the full uh, repository of the Spirit and he, and he has possession of it. The Spirit cannot go. And Micaiah told him, when you start running under the bed, you will know that the Spirit of God has spoken by me. So the question is, when we ask, have you been with Jesus? We're asking, can God confide in you? Does God confide in you? Can you be trusted with the word of God? Can you be entrusted with an assignment and you will do it? Have you been with Jesus? Can you be mistaken for Jesus? Have you been with Jesus? Has he rubbed off on you? Have you been with Jesus? Are you intimate with him? By the grace of God, next week, if God permits, we'll look at more on that subject. Otherwise, we'll move on to something else. But for now, I want us to go to God in prayer. And I want the essence of this is to challenge us that we, we must stop being the same people that we were. We have, to, we have to change. We have to be like Jesus on a daily basis. So let's go to him in prayer. Seek his face. I'm not just talking of the one we are going to, the one or two means that we're going to pray. No, 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 no. I mean in the course of this week, let's spend time with him in his word, in the place of prayer, and see what will happen to us. Let's make it a point of duty that we will constantly and consistently interact and have fellowship with him. That our personal relationship with him will be, will be, will be tight. That will be fully surrendered in our hearts to him. That whatever is left to be crucified in our lives, we will send it to the cross of Jesus and be crucified. I'm not asking you to pray now. I'm asking you to understand that these are the prayer points you are going to pray. I'm going to close us in prayer. But in the course of the week, that's what you are going to be praying. Let us pray now. Eternal Rock of Ages, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Thank you for your word. Oh, how, how we are challenged. Lord, indeed, we've seen men look at us because we are just ordinary. Lord, we want to be like Jesus. We want to spend time with him. We want to have been with him and to, to, be, to be with him on a regular basis. Almighty and everlasting God, we want our rub off. We want the nature of Christ to be formed in us. We want the Spirit of God to have access into our hearts. Help us, Lord, to open our hearts to him. To remove every veil that is keeping us from interacting with your Spirit and interacting with your Son. Help us, Almighty and Everlasting God, to have fellowship, deep fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. To leave the, 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 the ephemeral world of dancing and just singing and move into the place where we have fellowship with you, where we know with every conviction and fiber in us that it is you speaking and telling us something. And we can have conversation with you. Not just we hear something and we run away. No. But that Lord, we have constant conversation, constant fellowship with you. Have your way with us, Lord. Help us in the course of this week to spend quality time with you. Quality time with you. Talking to you. Studying the word. Listening to you. Hearing from you. Getting into conversation as a man speaks to his friend. At the end of everything, Father, let it be clear to all and sundry that we have been with Jesus and that we are being with Jesus. 
Thank you, everlasting Father. Blessed be your name, Lord. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen.